Good morning. Uh, welcome to Cancer Center Seminar. I'm happy to able to introduce Dr. Clark Chen as our speaker today. He received his undergraduate degree at Stanford, then a master's in epidemiology from Columbia. He then went on to an MD-PhD training program and received his PhD with Dr. Kolodner, working on yeast DNA repair, finished his medical degree at Harvard Medical School, and did a residency in neurosurgery at Harvard with specialty fellowships in radiosurgery and stereotactic neurosurgery. He's a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. DeAndre's lab where he continued to work on DNA repair, but now was doing this in human tumors as well as yeast. So he began his faculty career at Harvard, and then he moved to, uh, at Dana-Farber, and then moved to UCSD, where he ascended through the ranks. We were fortunate to recruit him here this summer from UCSD, where he's professor and chair of neurosurgery. So I want to comment on a couple of things. One of them is obviously uh, Dr. Chen is the prototypical physician scientist who works on pathways and sees how they apply to patients. The second thing I'd like to comment on is, as you know, uh, Dr. Jackson has taken on a new position. And so when we think about Dr. Jackson's legacy, I hope we remember his ability to recruit Dr. Chen here. Uh, and the third thing I wanted to comment on is for all of the faculty who may be in the room or listening, we always say how hard it is to recruit people to Minnesota from California, but it's possible. <laughs> uh, although Dr. Chen has not been through his first winter yet. So we'll see, we can ask him again in the spring. So at any rate, with great pleasure, I introduce Dr. Chen. The title of his talk today is Repurposing Antipsychotics as a Subtype Specific Glioblastoma Therapy. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, let me see and make sure this is not too. Can everyone hear me okay with this? All right. Well, uh, really uh, grateful to have an op opportunity to share this work with you. This is work that spanned over the past five, six years and really started with as a fundamental question uh, of. Well, what are the targets for, uh, tar for treating glioblastoma? The outline of the talk today uh, is like to share with you a little bit about uh, the a background in glioblastoma. In particular, I'd like to share with you an epidemiologic association that is rarely appreciated, but we think we actually have an answer for why this epidemiologic association uh, is observed. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that we've done pertaining to a genome-wide shRNA screen for no novel target identification, and ultimately how that translated into a subtype-specific therapy. So a little background. Glioblastoma is the most common form of primary brain cancer, and it is a very locally aggressive tumor. The interesting thing about glioblastoma is it almost never goes outside of the central nervous system. You know, you think about the way people die from cancer, it's usually from metastasis. But this is a cancer where it stays in the brain and it kills you because it aggressively infiltrates the brain. It doesn't go elsewhere. We don't really understand why that is, but I'm going to provide you with at least one insight into uh, this observation based upon the results that I'm showing you. There are limited therapeutic options. This is the only cancer that we know of where we have one FDA-approved chemotherapy and nothing more. And that chemotherapy is a DNA alkylating agent that dates back to the 1950s and 60s. That's how far we're behind in this cancer. There is a very interesting epidemiological association. I'm going to share that with you. This is very interesting. There's been many, many epidemiologic studies now that demonstrates that higher education and working in a non-manual capacity it's associated with increased risk for this disease. This is not something we talk about. In this study that was published uh, in, uh, or done in Sweden, in fact, these kind of studies could only be done in Sweden or in countries where people, individual patients, are followed throughout their lifetime. In the United States, we move so much. Me, for example, California to Minnesota. The California registries will lose me as I migrate, but that's not the case in, in countries like Sweden. They followed 4.3 million people, and they followed them for 17 years. And they looked at the risk of glioblastoma development. And it turns out that if you had more than three years of university education, you're about 20% more likely to develop this cancer than if you didn't. If you're in the higher socioeconomic status, you're also more likely. You know, everyone's smiling because, gosh, you know, we don't talk about this. This is not the only study. These are two other registry, three other registry studies where they looked at populations in the United States, 
in Los Angeles County, in the SEER database, consistently we see this association. Why is that? Well, it's probably multifactorial. Certainly, folks who are more educated are more aware of themselves. And so perhaps they self-monitor and self-detect. Perhaps it's because of stress. We talk about stress as a as compromising factor for the immune system, and, and the immune system surveys and prevents us from developing cancers. Perhaps it's lifestyle. Maybe there is an occupational hazard. But what I would submit to you is that there is yet another factor, and that actually that factor comes in play when we talk about when we're going to talk about the genome-wide screen that we're performing. So just keep this in mind, and we will come back to this issue after the basic sciences. So why do we do a genome-wide shRNA screen? As many of you know, shRNAs are basically like molecular erasers, right? It's been supplemented, or it's now supplanted by CRISPR, or initially talons and now CRISPRs. It's just a way to get rid of a gene, right? And what I just said to you is that there aren't any viable therapies in glioblastoma. So we wanted to identify targets that we could, you know, um, we could focus on in terms of therapeutic development. That's why we started this. The fundamental sprint. Um, the fundamental premise of the screen is the following. If you clone shRNA directed against the entire genome into a library and infect them into a cell, here I'm simply showing you three shRNAs, but you can imagine this on a genome-wide scale. If you infect it in a, at an MOI of one such that each cell carries only a single shRNA, and then you let the cells compete against one another, the shRNA that actually kills the cell will ultimately be underrepresented as you pop propagate that mixture of cell populations. On the other hand, the shRNA that is neutral with regard to viability, they will have some representation at the end of that propagation. In, other, in, in contrast, an shRNA that confers growth advantage will be overrepresented by the end of that passage. Does that make sense? This is the basic premise. Now, to put that into practice, uh, at the time when we were doing this, uh, Steve Illich and Hanahan had actually constructed 74,000 distinct shRNAs that targets all human genes. Um, there's average of three distinct shRNAs per gene. And this was cloned into an MSCV PM vector. This, uh, they've shown that this vector uh, produces sufficient shRNA such that it could uh, knock down genes at a, uh, at least a 50 to 70 percent uh, level uh, with a single copy integration. And so the workflow is something like this, where you basically take populations of glioblastoma cells and you infect them with pools. The entire genome was split into six pools. You infect it with pool, uh, pools of shRNA uh, that are barcoded. So each shRNA has a barcode so you can identify what they are. At the very beginning of the cell propagation, uh, you will label cells with a Psi5 dye. And you prop it, and then you infect them with shRNA. And so let them compete each, with each other. And then, by the end of 10 passages, you then take those cells and you label them with um, a, a Psi3. And so by comparing Psi5 to Psi3 in terms of representation and barcoding, you'll know which shRNA dropped out, which, H which shRNA is overrepresented. All right? So we did this. This took about a year, year and a half to do. And there's another trick to this entire screen, which is we wonder to what extent we could screen out in vitro artifacts, because there will be shRNAs that hits genes that are just required for growth in vitro in a tissue culture. What we really want is something that's specific to glioblastoma and not just anything that would kill cells in tissue culture, right? If, if you want that, you could just use bleach. So. What we did was we took independent lines. We took glio two glioblastoma lines, and we took two um, lung cancer cell lines. And this is actually a collaboration with another oncologist with interest in lung. We subtracted out the common things that are required for in vitro survival. So a lot of the things that dropped out are things like RAS, MYC, you know, things that are just needed for the cells to grow. So we were looking for glioblastoma-specific gene requirements for viability and lung-specific uh, genes uh, that are required for viability. So today I'm going to talk to you about the glioblastoma part of the story. Now, another very important thing to consider when you do screens is what line do you use? 
these are the, the, the properties that we look for before uh, doing the screen. We're looking for a cell line that can be easily infected. We're looking for a cell line that has a high efficiency of silencing, that has a reasonable growth rate. I mean, you don't want to do this experiment passaging you know, 10 times if each passage takes three months or each passage takes two weeks. You want to look for cell lines that are genomically stable. You don't want the cells changing while you're doing the screen, right? And you also want available genomic information so you can hybridize your functional data at the end back to the genomic information. So we impose these various. Now, the beauty of the system is that if you pick the right line, this cell, this, this, this um, model is extremely reproducible, right? So we, we found lines that has these properties. And in, in the next slide, what you're seeing here is we did the screen three times on three separate days with three different folks, right? This, but the results are extraordinarily reproducible. Now, to what extent this recapitulates intratumoral heterogeneity and all the other issues, that's a, we don't address that at all. We pick a stable line that's a glioblastoma that's easily infectable and silenceable, right? So to what extent this data is applicable to real tumors is an open question. But at the very least, what we know is that if you use the same line with the same screen, the technology is absolutely reproducible. Three experiments, the R squared between different experiments in terms of silencing uh, and, and viability impacts are on the order of 0.9. So then what you're seeing here then is we, we analyze, well, what are the SHRNAs that are overrepresented and underrepresented? We first analyze those which are un underrepresented with rationale that these are the genes that are required for glioblastoma viability and growth. Okay, remember, we subtracted out all the usual stuff that we target that are required for in vitro cell viability. This is unique to glioblastoma. And lo and behold, what do we find? We actually found a whole bunch of neurotransmitters. Right? Some of you are already anticipating the, the outcome of this talk, which is that cognition requires neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters facilitate glioblastoma growth. I'm going to show you some scary data. I know many of you smiled when I talked about this results. You're going to be thinking about this after this talk. So why is this, why is this exciting? Why is this exciting? Uh, why is neurotransmission exciting? It turns out that we use anti uh, we, uh, or antagonists to these transmitters routinely in the clinics. And many of these transmitters uh, or antagonists crosses the blood-brain barrier. Remember, one of the reasons why we don't have drugs for this disease is because the blood-brain barrier prevents the drug from getting in. So if we already have drugs that gets in, hallelujah. I mean, let's go to trial, right? So that is why we're very excited about that. These are the various genes that came out. The ones that are starred, for example, DRD2, are the ones in which we hit, what was a, that scored as a hit. In other words, if you silence those genes, glioblastoma cannot grow anymore. So what are dopamine receptors, right? This is really, again, the pharmacologic inhibitors are available. They penetrate the blood-brain barrier. I use it on my patients just about every day. Haloperidol, for example, is used as antipsychotics. It's routinely used as chemical restraint for agitated patients in the ICU, so it's already in the clinic. The problem is because it's already in the clinic, people are not going to make a lot of money from it, right? So people are racing to make new derivatives of something like this. There are five different types of dopamine receptors, but generally they're classified as D1 versus D2. The most important thing that I want you to know from this slide is they are expressed in astrocytes. And usually we think of these neurotransmission receptors as present in neurons, but the reality is they're also present in astrocytes and typically at a lower level. For example, these are neurons and glia isolated from um, uh, human specimens uh, from autopsy. And what you can see is that there is, for example, DRD2 expression at low levels in the glia. More importantly, what the, the function of these receptors are, they're there to uptake dopamine so that there's not persistent signaling. They're there to recycle del dopamine. As a result of this recycling, it actually triggers mitotic proliferation of the astrocytes. So in other words, if you have a lot of dopamine, the astrocytes will proliferate. They'll, they'll sense the dopamine. They'll take it in, and then they will proliferate. So the, 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 the dopamine actually carries out mitotic functions for normal astrocytes. And what we, believe, what we believe is these functions are now being subverted to facilitate glioblastoma growth, right? 
glioblastoma comes from astrocytes. So we did the obligatory, uh, obligatory experiments. We took independent SHRNAs, we knocked down DRD2, and we could see that the viability is significantly compromised. We took multiple uh, inhibitors uh, or an available antagonists against dopamine receptor 2, DRD2, we see that they also inhibit glioblastoma growth. Now, one thing you'll notice is the SHRNA actually works a lot better than the drug. So there is something here that we don't quite understand yet. But we consistently see this effect. We wanted to demonstrate this in vivo. These, these are very important experiments that actually people don't actually do. So of course, we cloned uh, the shRNA into a, a DOCS inducible construct so we could turn it on and off. And in fact, the moment we turn on the shRNA, the tumor stops to grow in, vi in vivo. This next experiment is very, very important. Again, we don't always do it, but I think we should insist on a, as this as a standard. Anytime you do shRNA screens or drug screens, you're worried about off-target effects. In order to address that issue, you must be able to rescue your phenotype with the SH resistant construct. Right? Because lots of phenotype is something that's easy to score. Just about, think about bleach again. You could kill tumors by tossing in bleach, but is that a specific effect? Does that really mean anything? The important experiment here is we actually put a DRD2 that's resistant to SH. We, we did a silent mutation in the region of the SH RNA binding. We put it into, we put it into other mice. And what we can show here is when we put a SH RNA resistant DRD2 construct and then you induce the expression of that SH RNA, we can bypass that effect. So demonstrating that this is a specific effect rather than an off-target effect. Now, this does not say that that the shRNA does not hit another target in addition to DRD2, but it does demonstrate that at least DRD2 is a bona fide target of this shRNA. Yes, we did. I, that's coming up. Thank you very much for that for ask for asking. I can see things better here, so I'm going to step outside of the. So. First, we wanted to demonstrate that the amount of dopamine receptor, DRD2 receptor, is L overexpressed in glioblastoma, right? Because remember, for normal astrocytes, the expression level is actually quite low, right? So in order to produce this dramatic mitotic drive, we expect that the, the receptor will be overexpressed. And we did this. These are patient samples I've taken um, under IRB. N for normal, or we really shouldn't call them normal. They're, they're adjacent to the tumor, and we know the tumor is infiltrative, so we call them near normal. And tumors. And these are the expression levels of DRD2 by mRNA. By protein, you can see that tumor normal. These are matched from the same patient. All right. So you can see that, indeed, the expression of the dopamine receptor is elevated, both by mRNA uh, analysis and by protein analysis. We then took a number of different um, models. So this is a model where. It, this is a, uh, a gym model where uh, NF1 was uh, mutated and P53 is mutated in addition. You get a glioblastoma here. This is just astrocyte. So astrocyte, glioblastoma. Same thing, this is another model where P53 and P10 are both disrupted. You can get a glio glioblastoma here, this is, and this is normal. What you can see, again, is in a, tra in a gym model, you see that, and this is tissue culture, you can see that DRD2 is expressed when the tumor is transformed to become a glioblastoma. This, these are in vivo tumors. So these are tumors where these are mice that develop tumors in their brain. We take out the half of the brain that has no tumor versus the half of the brain that has tumor. And we can see that in vivo, DRD2 expression in mouse is also elevated. So higher level of dopamine receptor. And this is the experiment you're asking about. Is there a difference between the sensitivity of the astrocytes versus the glioblastoma? So because we have these models, we could do that experiment. So we could see that in the glioblastoma model, Halibert, that was very effective in killing the tumor. Whereas in the astrocyte, that's not less so. Similarly, for the P53 model. So indeed, we see a, a, a opportunity, a therapeutic window here in terms of um, targeting dopamine receptors. Now, the necessary next step for all the investigators is, well, what's the mechanism for this, right? So we know that there are key cellular pathways in maintaining the oncogenic state. We talked about RAS, ERK, AKT. This is the mTOR pathway, the STAT3 pathway. So we wanted to see which of these pathways are disrupted 
by the antipsychotics. And what you can see here is if you were, these are four independent antipsychotics that target DRD2. Now, they all have some off-target effects. So we use four, and we look for common patterns, right? And so what you can see here is that the, really the key thing that changed between the various pathways here, so this is to total ERG, phosphor ERG, you can see that ERG was significantly suppressed, whereas your uh, STAT3, your AKT, and your SS6 is not significantly affected by treatment with four independent antipsychotics. We reproduce the same result with SHRNAs, where we, again, use the DOCS inducible SHRNA construct. When you induce SHRNA, the phosphor ERG goes down. If you have a construct that bears a SHRNA resistant uh, expression, SHRNA reduction no longer changes ERK. So again, demonstrating specificity. If you add an agonist of DRD2, when you activate DRD2, what you can see is you can, again, activate phospho ERK, suggesting that the dopamine signaling within glioblastoma is going through the phospho ERK pathway. Now, we wanted to connect DRD2 and, and ERK, right? What is that missing link? Uh, it turns out many of the G protein couple receptors like GRG2, their functions are mediate, mediated through G proteins. This is, of course, a, the recipient. This discovery was the recipient of a Nobel Prize, these G proteins. And it turns out that the DRD2 is associated specifically with a GI alpha protein. There are three distinct uh, uh, GI alpha proteins in the human genome. They're just named GNI1, 2, and 3. I'm not showing you this data, but it turns out that GNAI2 also score very positive as a antiproliferative gene in our SHRNA screen. Moreover, GNAI2 expression highly correlate with that of DRD2 in glioblastoma. So we said, well, perhaps that is the link. Perhaps that, and in fact, more importantly, GNAI2 has been shown to modulate ERK phosphorylation through uh, uh, intermediary protein. So we, we checked and see whether or not GNI2 was also overexpressed like DRD2, and it, indeed it is. And in fact, when we silence GNI2, we could see that phospho ERK is suppressed. So I just told you, and this is that the, the GNAIs interact with proteins that actually interfere with RAS function. Many of you know RAS is a small G protein, and it's only active in a GTP-bound form. The GTP-bound form could be, uh, the GTP can be hydrolyzed by these um, uh, other small G proteins. And so when you when RAP GTP is present, it actually hydrolyzes the GTP in RAS and render it inactive. It turns out that the alpha subunit of GNAI interacts with a protein that hydrolyzes this GTP. So it's an inhibitor of an inhibitor. So that the absence of this, or rather the activation, results in phospho-ERK accumulation. All right? This was done in a very beautifully uh, published uh, Nature paper in 1999. So what we show you here is that if you were to take a, if you were to take an agonist against dopamine, you could see, again, phospho-ERK is um, increased, suggesting pathway activation. And the RAB GTP is decreased because you're activating this particular uh, RAB GAP2. When you take a SIGNA2, SIRNA, when you silence it, phospho ERK goes away and RAB1 GTP goes up. Um, and we did that independently with two different SIRNAs. So ultimately, what we think is happening is that the dopamine uh, activation results in the activation of GNAI1 that triggers RAB GTP function resulting ultimately in the activation of RAS and phospho-ERK. That's the pathway through which we believe dopamine is acting. Now, this is the necessary last slide for every cancer, or last figure for every cancer paper, right? You've got to demonstrate efficacy, and you have to demonstrate big efficacy if you want to get them into big journals, right? Unfortunately, our field has evolved or degenerated to this, but that's, that's what it is. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't see a big effect in vivo, and this is ultimately why you know we, this was co-submitted to Nature, and, and you know the, the comment was we didn't see an impressive effect in vivo, so we don't want it. Um, so here's what what's happening. So we took again, we we 
when we treat cells with uh, haloperidol, which again is a antipsychotic I use routinely in clinics, we know it gets across the blood-brain barrier, we know micromolar achievement can be, uh, or micromolar concentration can be achieved. We do see a suppression of vox earth, but the viability here for this particular model isn't quite as impressive. But if you combine it, we, EGFR is also highly overexpressed in certain glioblastomas. And we're going to come back to this issue momentarily in, in, a, in, in the later, later in this talk. It turns out if you treat cells that are highly expressed with EGFR, with this EGFR inhibition, it actually doesn't affect the viability that much, although phospho-earth is decreased and phosphorylation of EGFR is also impacted. But when you combine the two, you see a very dramatic effect, right? So it, what this data suggests is that these glioblastomas have sort of joint mitotic drives, both EGFR and dopamine contributing to that effect. And so uh, again, we see this two, in two independent lines. And in fact, in the xenograft model, we really don't see a significant effect with haloperidol alone in this model. Okay, I'm going to emphasize in this model. You'll see why uh, later in this talk. But you see a significant effect when they're combined, right? And we can recapitulate that in the um, in intracranially, and we can see that when they're combined, fossil earth is much more uh, suppressed and essentially recapitulating the in vitro effect. So again, the major comment on this paper was, listen, how paradox itself does is no good, so we don't want the paper. Well, it is what it is. Yes. Yeah, we did, and it essentially, it's basically the same patterns, basically. So, so there are. So the question here is that when you do these xenograft models, you could test tumor initiation or tumor uh, sort of growth once the tumor is formed. It, it's essentially the same effect. Right. So, oh yes. So these are sub Q. Th these is sub Q, and this is in your brain. I should explain this better. My apologies. When you implant it in the brain. When they get to a certain stage of sickness, you need to sacrifice them. So when they die here, it's because of the tumor growth. And what you're seeing is, is that independently, both the, the antipsychotic and the EGFR inhibition does not significantly prolong survival, i.e. slow the tumor growth, whereas you could actually see prolongation of tumor, uh, rather survival, therefore slowing down of the tumor. And so these two data are si uh, complementary. This is subcutaneous, and this is intracranial. And this is from intracranial. Use of uh, both your, you know. Yes. So this is the combined. Yeah. That's all combined. Do you mind being interrupted with questions Please, during no, the talk? Not at all. Okay. At all. Then That's what we need to do is use the microphones because we have people in three other sites that can't hear your question, and so the answer isn't as meaningful. So I will repeat the question. Okay. And then or I'll raise repeat. your hand and I'll bring you. I'll mic. repeat the question. Yes. Go ahead. I I I think that this. So the question is, is, is this the effect we're seeing the result of re retarding growth, or is it a induction of apoptosis or other yeah. cell death mechanisms? And the answer is it's a combination of both. Okay. So what about the epidemiologic association? I kind of highlighted this already. So we know neurotransmission underlies the basis of cognition. Higher order of cognition requires, requires neurotransmission. Here's the scary experiment. This is the experiment I wish I was smart enough to do. If I'd done it, I would have gone on cell paper, but I didn't. The experiment was they used a, um, a, 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 a genetic model, right, where you could actually using, um, you could trigger through photolight activation of neurons. And they implanted a tumor adjacent, not, not where you're stimulating, but adjacent to it. They asked the question, if you were to fire neurons repeatedly, are you going to induce glioblastoma growth? Not so many people's laughing now, huh? And in fact, it does. In fact, it does. This is why this paper came in cell. Neuronal activity triggers release of neurotransmitters like dopamine. Those dopamine facilitates transformation potential and growth of glioblastoma. If we had done this experiment for our paper, we'd have gotten in a, a much. But this this is a four-year experiment. Right? Optical genetics is not a trivial thing to set up. So, 
The other thing that, that's important is, remember I told you that glioblosoma never leaves the brain. Almost never. Sometimes they do. When they mutate enough, they'll do. Why is that? From our data, what we believe is that the neurotransmitter that's released in the native environment is important to maintain glioblosoma growth. We talked about the stem cell niche, right? For example, to maintain certain stem cells. And it's all, we always talk about the neurovasculature. But that niche also has a component of the astrocyte to it. And that niche also has a neurochemical component to it. Because nerves tend to follow vessels. So part of the reason why glioblosoma does not exit the brain may indeed be that they need neurotransmitters as trophic factors. And in fact, if they leave the brain, they don't get that anymore. And that's why you don't get metastasis from the glioblosoma. So the implication of this is quite interesting. So where do we go from here, right? So it turns out that with the TCGA and a number of proteomic efforts, uh, we realize glioblastoma is really not one disease anymore. Remember, I keep harping on in this model. We don't see an effect, not a great effect of haloperidol alone in this model. Well, it turns out that when we profile glioblastoma using a multitude of, of, of tools, whether that be transcriptomic, microomics, proteomics, or pathway analysis, consistently we see that glioblastoma fall in distinct categories. We classify them as subtypes. All right? And really, in glioblastoma, there are now five distinct subtypes, of which one has been very well characterized, the, the so-called IDH mutant. I'm not going to talk about this today. If there's interest, we, we work on this as well. But the reality is that there are other subtypes, the term proneural, neural, classical, mesenchymal. And they all have distinct genomic signatures in terms of mutations. The IDH one mutation, of course, is well known. And well, it's currently a very hot field to study. The proneural tumors are driven by PDGFR. Oh. The neural tumors are driven by ERP2. The classicals are driven by EGFR and mesenchymal NF1P53. Now, in some ways, we kind of know about this already. In the past, there's something called primary versus secondary glioblastoma. The primary glioblastomas are the tumors that grow in younger folks, and the secondary tend to occur in older folks. It turns out that these are essentially the primary glioblastomas, and these are secondary glioblastomas. Basically, what we've done is taken clinical observations and tagged molecular terms to it, OK? Now, these subtypes are real. We could generate subtype-specific xenografts. We could look at their pathway activations. They're inherently different. Moreover, this is, uh, this is a cover for one of our articles. These subtypes locate in distinct parts of the brain. They're, they arise from distinct precursor cells, all right? Moreover, these subtypes have distinct mitotic drives. If you look at the mesenchymal and classical subtypes, so these are three clinical databases where tumors have been profiled transcriptomally, and we also have clinical database or, or data sort of in terms of their outcome. The CGGA is a part of a, a collaborative that I, I help with in China. Rembrandt is the precursor of the TCGA. So these are all tumors that have been profiled. So we could define what subtypes they are. And when you look at the pathway activation of these subtypes, what you realize is in the classical and mesenchymal subtypes, the EGFRs, the RTKs, are hyperactive and consistently in three different databases. Right? I keep harping on this. Anytime you do a correlation and you see a P of 0.05, it just means you're wrong 5% of the time. It doesn't mean it's true. So you really need to validate, validate, validate. All right? So, and that's what we did here. We validated, validated, validated. This is a total of almost 900 patients, with 500 here, 200 here, and 200 here. The subtypes, glioblastoma subtypes, in terms of mesenchymal and classical subtypes, these are driven by right, the RTKs. What is driving the proneural and neural? Well, heck, we just found a new pathway, so let's look at whether or not they're different, right? whether or not DRD2 actually is responsible for driving this. If so, then we now have a subtype-specific therapy. And of course, by the title of the talk, you know the results can be positive. Otherwise, we'll be talking about it. But that's the rationale, OK? This is to confirm that pathway activation is indeed different. Anytime, again, validate, validate, validate. Not only do you want to validate in, in different repetitions, you want to validate using different technologies. Here it's using IHT, where we stand for EGFR, PDGFR, and CMET. And you could see that in the mesenchymal cl classical subtype, there's much higher activation of this pathway by IHT assessment as well. 
So what, what do we do next? So in order to understand what are the mitotic drives for the pro-neural and, and, and the neural, we grouped them. We basically took those three databases and we filtered against one another. So we said, OK, let's group pro-neural and neural and classical mesenchymal and see what are the differentially expressed genes. And it has to be true in all three databases. And then we do a pathway analysis. And it turns out, when you do that, the genes that are enriched in the pro-neural and neural uh, subtype are genes required for neurogenesis and for differentiation, both of which fits the bill for dopamine receptor. So then we say, well, OK, is it the case that the subtype of pro-neural is more sensitive to dopamine inhibition and the, the ones where mesenchymal are more sensitive to EGFR inhibition, right? Maybe we just didn't use the right model, and that's why four years, three years ago, we can't publish a bigger profile paper. And in fact, that's exactly what we saw. These are three separate mesenchymal glioblastoma lines. These are three pro-neural lines. If you look at EGFR expression, it's day and night. Just exactly what you saw in the transcriptome analysis. All right? If you look at DRD2, it's the other way around. Now, you might ask, well, what's activating the DRD2? DRD2 is just a receptor. You need dopamine, right? It turns out this is an autoprint loop. If you look at, this is ELISA for dopamine, the neurotransmitter. These pro-neural pro, uh, cells actually secrete dopamine. They're at a much higher level than the mesenchymal. So not only do you have the receptor, the cells is also making the growth factor. So here's the key experiment, right, in vitro. If you take an EGFR inhibition inhibitor and you use a high concentration, you can suppress mesenchymal, uh, the, the growth of mesenchymal lines. But that doesn't work for the pro-neural lines, at least not as well. If you take a haloperidol, it doesn't work at all for the mesenchymal. And this is exactly what we saw. This is, this is what we published three years ago. But it works extremely well for this other side. So if we had this result, it would have been a, a different story. We can't recapitulate that in, in vivo. This is a subcutaneous model. We also have an intracranial model. Effectively, for the mesenchymal lines, Treating with haloperidol, it doesn't touch it. And that's exactly what we saw before. Whereas, if you see the pro-neural lines tend to grow more slowly, and if you treat it with haloperidol, you can shut it down. And when you shut it down, the ERK goes away. Now, very interesting, right? What about translational potential? This is a paper that came out recently. This is a long-term survival in a patient with glucose. Glastoma. Most patients who have this disease die within two years. To have someone who lives five, six years is very unusual. In fact, the first thing you think about when someone tells you someone had a, you know, a survival five years after glioblastoma is you say, you made the wrong diagnosis from the start. That was never a glioblastoma. Well, in this case, the folks here actually went back and looked at this. This is glioblastoma. I mean, I don't know if uh, Brent and uh, Clark is here, but this is bona fide glioblastoma. It has a high mitotic index, 15%. This is a highly aggressive glioblastoma. This guy lived five years, and he was taking antipsychotics. Right? This is, a, this is for the aficionados. This is an IDH wild type tumor. It turns out IDH mutation confers a more probable, high, uh, favorable survival. So if you have that mutation, you're expected to live longer. This guy does not have that mutation. Highly unusual for this. More importantly. I just found this paper as I was preparing for this talk. This is going to come out in clinical cancer research. There is a new dopamine uh, DRD2 inhibitor that's currently in clinical trial for a number of solid tumors. This paper, literally, I, I couldn't copy the paper because it's only a preprint draft. And they tested this in the 10 patients, saw very, very impressive concentrations in terms of micromolar dose uh, in the blood. They don't have efficacy yet. This is just a phase one safety kind of experiment. So what am I telling you? That glioblastoma subverts an existing dopamine-related uh, mitotic uh, circuitry. It, this may account for the association between neuronal activity and tumor growth. More and more, there's been several impressive science papers about how prostate cancer can be stopped, the growth of prostate cancer could be stopped if you cut off the cholinergic nerves that goes into the cancer. This is not only the only example. 
the neurotropic niche is something that we're becoming more and more aware of. Remember, the nerves follow the vessel. This is an insight every surgeon has, right? Every time we dissect a vessel, the nerves are right there. It may account for the epidemi um, epidemiologic association between higher education and fetal placenta risk. It may, I mean, think about it, right? I mean, think about the folks who have been affected with glioblastoma. Senator Edward Kennedy, right? When he died, the Democratic supermajority ended in the Senate. Bo Biden, highly educated. When he died, Vice President Biden did not run for office. Imagine what could have happened, right? The what is. McCain, highly, highly intellectual. He realized he had, had a glioblastoma before he voted on the Affordable Care Act. I'm sure that awareness impacted his decision. Gershwin died of glioblastoma. He acutely collapsed, and on autopsy, he, it was found that he died of a glial tumor. Imagine a world without Gershwin. Because of the impact and the association with, with education, I think the, 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 the true influence of this disease in our society is still yet to be understood. The circuitry of the signaling is mediated through a GNAI2 protein, ultimately through ERK. ERD2 mediated mitogenesis may play uh, particularly important roles in one subtype of glioblastoma. In another subtype, it's there to facilitate EGFR. And because of the drugs are available, because of the concentration that we could achieve, I think that consideration is warranted for testing blood-brain barrier penetrant DRD2 antagonists, subtype-specific uh, glioblastoma therapy. Thank you for your attention. So, so next time, don't think so hard. <laughs> yeah. So I have a kind of naive question. You know, that when you tested the effect of a uh, haloperidol in uh, intracranial or sub-Q model in mice, you showed there. Are they moving along happily or somewhat sedated? <laughs> Very good. We had we use a high concentration that was sedated for about two hours after IV infiltration. The reason I ask that question is that most of the psychotic patients, their tolerable dose before sedation is probably at least one order higher than normal people. Then whether that higher dose helps that patient or not, that's the fundamental reason of this question. Well, I mean, and, and it adds a confounding factor, right? So if, if the CNS is suppressed, neuronal activity is suppressed in general, so is it really a dopamine-specific effect? We don't know. Uh, what is known is that w when we I I infuse the mouse in the first two hours, they're kind of you know groggy and not moving as quickly, and then they recover after that. And we see that in humans too. It's, it's the basis of chemical restraint. Yeah, maybe I missed this, but do you see any differences in growth between the different mesenchymal or pronural subtypes? Yes, yeah, so I did mention that a little bit. The pronural tumors tend to grow slower. Remember, I talked to you and I said that there are two subtypes of glioblastoma, the secondary and the primary. The secondary tend to kind of change from phase grade, grade two to three to four. They tend to grow slower. So the pronural subtype glioblastomas tend to grow more slowly than the mesenchymal. And in fact, if you go back and look at the slide in the sub-Q model, you could see that. These are the mesenchymal lines. You can see how they just they blow up, right? So I can share a story with you. When I was a resident at Mass General, I saw a patient with a headache. He came in, he got an MRI, completely normal MRI. Right? A month later, I saw the patient again, again headache. This time, he has a three centimeter tumor inside the head. All right? So I was so scared that I missed something, I went back to the you know, original scan, I reviewed it with everybody to make sure I didn't. The reality is secondary glioblastoma, or primary glioblastoma, the ones that popped up when you're old, they blow up quickly, just like this. The tumors that kind of grow through stages, they tend to grow more slowly, and they grow like this. This is a, we also have an intracranial model. Yeah, absolutely. Clark. Yes. Uh, comment and question. So, you know, there are many parallels between neural stem cells and brain tumor stem cells. And one of the, the features of uh, neural stem cells is that they can be modulated by the, the dopamine input from the substantia nigra. And so they can, as you activate that particular pathway, you can actually increase proliferation. So it seems like there may be some, some similarities there between 
the two types of stem cells. I agree. I, I think what it is is that you know the cancer cells are they're just experts at subverting whatever you got and making it to a benefit. If you look at the mechanism of, of mitogenesis, it's always something that's already there, and the cancer just takes it and then kind of twists it around in a way that that you know allows uncontrolled proliferation. So my question to you is that you know given the, your findings about these dopamine receptors, have you seen or have people? I, I've not seen reports of dopamine nerve fibers innervating uh, you know, brain tumor cells. Or has anybody reported that? You know, um, whether there are actually so. There are two layers to that question. The first layer is when you have nerve innervation, you uh, do you facilitate tumor formation, and that's the neuronal activity paper. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to glioblastoma. That's probably not there anymore. Remember what I just showed you, which is that these tumors Body make their own neural. By the time they transform, they acquire the ability to make their own neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. You don't need them anymore. Yeah. So, is there any also any cross reactivity between dopamine and other catecholamines, such as norepinephrine and epinephrine? Yeah. So, not not that we're aware of for this particular uh, not, not for this particular phenotype, but just remember our initial screen. We chased down one pathway. One of many. Glutamate pathways also impacts growth. We just haven't validated it, right? It takes the screen is the easy part. It takes a year to do the screen. It takes four years to follow it up. We chase down dopamine because there are drugs we could use. There are again glutamate receptors, acetylcholine receptors, serotonin receptors, and many of these drugs have off-target effects. These are all potential for future therapeutic development. Doug? So do you know what um, what's downstream of fossil ERK, and particularly in the cyclin profile? And the reason I'm asking is some of the CDK inhibitors being developed in breast cancer, at least, are very CNS penetrant. That's really that's a great question. And in fact, the trials are ongoing for some of those. Um, and I, I think the right way to do those experiments is to Infuse that remove tumor, analyze concentration before, right, looking for response, and and those experiments are in the way. The downstream effect of ERGs are highly pleiotropic, and we what we try to do is to try to see what if we could recapitulate silencing X and Y relative to ERG, and those efforts kind of didn't pan out very well. In fact, that's one of the reviewers' question from Nature: is what is what is happening downstream, and we have not been able to recapitulate. I mean. By the time you get three siRNAs in, the cells are pretty sick. And they're going to be sick anyway. It's going to be hard. Two siRNAs hasn't reproduced the same kind of effect that we saw with uh, ERK. So the downstream effects are still murky. So has um, autocrine dopamine production been described in any other tumor type? Ah, other tumor type. Uh, I'm going to toss it out to uh, other tumor type specialists. I, I actually, I, the answer is I don't know. The answer is I don't know. Um, I would imagine that if you were sub to subscribe to that oncology recapitulate ontology, that those cells which utilizes dopamine as part of the growth cycle, when they become tumor, that would be a pathway that could, they could subvert, right? So if you subscribe to that concept, I would imagine they will be, but I just don't know the number. I don't know the number. Well, I. We're going to report this, <laughs> whatever that's worth. Yes. So, yes. Is, there, is there evidence that patients who receive dopamine or other serotonin or whatever for other diseases like Parkinson have a higher prevalence of glioblastoma? Well, uh, you don't give dopamine to patients. That, that's not. That's we don't do that clinically. Uh, you don't give serotonin to to patients in general. I mean, you, you, you take melatonin, which is related, but it's not. Uh, we don't give the, the kind of concentration. If you, if you look at if you look at the concentration we're given for the agonist, uh, like here, the concentration here again is is on the border, border of nano and micromolar. It, you can't get that kind of concentration for neurotransmission uh, as an agonist to the patient. Then is a local concentration within tumor equivalent to such concentration. Oh yeah, is yeah, so yeah. yeah. What's, what's interesting is if you look at if you if you we did this experiment, if you look if you try to quantitate how much that is, that is in the micromolar range. So 
it's very exciting. I'm trying to prevent uh, <laughs> dopamine release in my head. <laughs> by you don't want to do that. Excited. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel good. <laughs> so, so I, I'm just thinking about the whole global picture of uh, you know these neurotransmitters being released and they are being used more and more now in effective modulation of pain. And when there is effective modulation, uh, either they will be inhibited or released, but in this case, released. And I'm wondering if they would initiate the, the progression, initiate or promote the progression of the tumor if they are released. And that's, that's a key question. That's a important, very important question. And I think the answer is in the proper context, it uh, it will, in the proper context. If you have the right circuit with the right receptor and the right transmitter, which in this case is a growth factor, but the convergence of those circumstances will be unusual, right? To have a pain person, right? Just like there was a case report, right? The antipsychotic was someone who just needed that, who just happened to be have a glioblastoma. Those are going to be rarities in in in, in, in that situation. If you think about this, right, it, it's, it's very impressive uh, in terms of what we do in cancer. The same things that cause cancer we're using to treat cancer, right? Under the right circumstances, it's either killing cancer or inducing cancer. Radiation makes cancer, kills cancer. Chemotherapy makes cancer, kills cancer, right? Under the right context, I think everything is a dual blade. And I'm just wondering when the, in these higher brain centers there is modulation of these neurotransmitters, it's also likely that opioids are released and it, it maintain could, the yeah. vascular supply. It, it could very well be. I, I don't know that anyone's ever looked at uh, addicts in terms of autopsy and, and innovation. That would be certainly something that could be looked at. Um, you know, a fundamental question is the context also requires, the right context also requires the amount of concentration. That is right, right? So the beauty, the, the hypothesis with the neurotransmission is there is high focal concentration within just that little pocket. It's not a global. If you had that kind of concentration that that's present in the local pocket throughout the whole brain, we wouldn't survive, right? Our, our body's not handled, uh, can't handle that kind of load. So the beauty of neurotransmission is that's highly focused around the synaptic junction. And the result is if you, that nice beautiful cell paper from Stanford is if you move tumor far enough, uh, from the optical genetic system, then you don't see the effect. That's their negative control. So everything has to, it, it isn't just firing, it's firing the right context with the right concentration, you know. So, so uh, and, and this is why I don't want to scare any, anyone unnecessarily. The risk of glioblastoma is low. It, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's low relative to breast cancer. So when you see a increase, a 20% increase in relative risk for a low cancer, low risk cancer, it is still low. So I don't want everyone to go home and start just stop writing grants. Yeah, exactly. That's not the intent of today's talk. I, I just have a comment. So yeah. you know, the the end point of MAP kinase signaling is is very frequently the stabilization of a whole collection of oncogenic transcription factors. So Mick, Foss, June, um, these guys won't go up in mRNA content, they won't show up on any deep sequencing screen. And what happens is this is due to sustained MAP kinase signaling that stabilizes these guys. So that might be a really easy readout to see in, say, brain slicers or, you know, IHC, for example. And it, it's really a body of work from John Blennis. You might look at that and say you could maybe use that as a readout of what's happening downstream. No, I, don't, I know John well. We you talked a lot. You might have reviewed your paper. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, 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 it's a very good comment. We, we talked a lot about that. The, um, uh, and it, it was actually one of the projects that didn't quite work out for technical reasons. And we can discuss offline. But John, John we, we talked about this. Um, so would you expect conditions like um, epilepsy or those who've received um, electroshock treatment to be at a higher risk for glioblastoma? It depends. I, I don't know what the local concentration is, and I don't know um, to what extent if you have global release of various transmitters, whether they will antagonize or they, you know. Again, it's all about context, and I don't know what the context is in that microenvironment when you do ECT. The presumption is everything is, is released, 
but is that actually the case, right? Is, is it really, the, I mean, do you have a, I don't know. Do you have a massive surge of neural transmission at ECT, or is the system actually shut down, right? Uh, and what's the kinetics of that? So I, it's a great question. I, you know, it's a great question to study. Uh, I just don't know the data. Other questions? All right. Uh huh. Uh, feeding them uh, an enriched diet. I'd be happy with that. And and the males are housed with the female, and they release more dopamine, and also serotonin. <laughs> 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 it's it's mom's chicken things. soup. <laughs> no, it's um, high calorie, high energy, yeah. and also higher amino acids, and um, uh, uh, and uh, that uh, fatty acid. I mean, uh, it's it's it, you know it's it's imp again I don't want to overinterpret this data set in that uh, the kind of effect that we're seeing at are at a fairly high concentration and so uh, you know and and so clearly dopamine is required for a number of euphoric its uh, effects is required for learning is required for a lot of different higher order functions we can manipulate that in various ways remember what I have not shown you right the link if you really put my statements to scrutiny, is, is a little tenuous. What I've shown you is if you implant a tumor next to an optical genetic system, the tumor will grow faster. What I have not shown you is what I'm proposing, which is if you take a normal mouse and just keep activating with optical genetics, you'll get a tumor. That's a much higher order ask. That experiment should probably be done in a mouse with a predisposition already, because the likelihood of that is probably uh, lower than so again I don't want folks to walk away from this over interpreting the data know what the data is know the potential association know the what you know know the actual findings any other questions thank you very much